Okay. And are you seeing my full screen? Yes, we're go. All good. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing my logo. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for, for coming um, from all over the place today. Um, here in Central Maryland, we've got uh, the wood frogs coming out today in our pond in our backyard. So that's exciting. And um, Michael and I are really excited to talk to you about this phenomenon. Um, as Bronwyn mentioned, it really all started with this kind of um, sort of uh, lazy meandering walk in the garden one night. I was taking a break and I just wanted to go down the garden path and let my mind wander with my feet. And this was a scene that um, was in front of my house that night. I just uh, started taking pictures and, um, and this is in uh, Sykesville, which for those of you not in Maryland, were about half an hour from Baltimore. And the first thing I noticed was um, something that's not anything unusual um, at our place. Uh, I see it on many summer days, a male monarch nectaring on the common milkweed and, and flying around um, among the flowers. But I decided to follow him with my camera anyway. And that's a good thing I did because the next thing I saw looked very unusual. He stopped on a leaf of a completely different plant and stayed there for quite a while. And so that caught my attention. And monarchs perch on leaves a lot, right? But this seemed really different to me. So I zoomed in and that's when I saw that he was not perching at all. He was actively extending his proboscis onto the leaf. And this is a, a bone set plant that you see here. Uh, and he was seeming to want to extract something from this. Um, and so, I didn't see it at the time, but you can um, you can see there there's a little flea beetle here on the leaf, and that will become important uh, later. I'll tell you about in a few slides. Now, if you look closely in this clip, you can see that he's scratching the leaf with his foot, and that was kind of hard to capture on film, and it happens kind of quickly. But I saw it a number of times, and to me, it just showed how intensely he wanted to get something out of this plant. And this plant bone set, Eupatorium serotinum, is a white flowering native wildflower. And it, it wasn't in flower yet at this time of the year because it was late June then. Uh, it usually flowers starting in August. And I didn't even plant these plants. They were um, volunteers in, in my garden. They sprouted from probably from the seed bank about 15 years ago, and they grow abundantly all over our habitat now. Um, and the flowers are big attractants for all sorts of butterflies and, and bees and wasps and beetles. And these are uh, pearl crescent butterflies here in the late summer. And so we all know that adult butterflies of lots of species go to flowers, but um, going to the leaves, I had never heard of that. And I just wondered, what could they possibly hope to gain from it? And who are these mystery monarchs in my garden? I tried to figure out what was going on by searching online, but it didn't get me very far at that time. So I posted my videos to a Facebook insect group um, and Don Harvey, who is a retired lepidopterist um, who was working at the Smithsonian and now he, um, he works a lot with native bees. He responded pretty quickly. And he said that the monarchs are likely gathering the secondary plant compounds known as pyrolyzidine alkaloids. And um, this is something everyone calls them PAs for short. Um, and so he pasted in a link to an abstract of a paper called Leaf Scratching, a Specialized Behavior of Denaying Butterflies for Gathering Secondary Plant Substances. 
Well, I read this paper written in 1983 by Dr. Michael Beaupre at the University of Freiburg, and he described other milkweed butterfly species extracting PAs to use in courtship and defense. And they get these substances from dried or injured leaves of certain plants. Um, but not only that, he also talked in this paper about watching butterflies go to leaves of plants that already had holes made in them by flea beetles um, when he was studying this in Africa. And so I looked back at, at my videos and I saw that sure enough, there were those flea beetles on the bone set plants. And this was, these uh, parallels were really exciting to me. So I, I did a little more reading and I mentioned it in just a few uh, write-ups and social media posts. And then I got busy, I put it aside um, for the winter and I, I thought it was really cool, but I thought I'll just write about that sometime in the future. But the monarchs didn't put it aside because the next summer they were at it again. I was walking to the mailbox one day and this female monarch was working away at this completely dead bone set by the road. So I started watching her and she stayed for a good long time there. This was a plant that I'd been intending to trim because, you know, it was dead. It was right by the path that people walk on with their dogs and such. So I thought it would be good to uh, make it pretty again, but I'm glad I didn't because this monarch was on this plant, on the stems, on the leaves for a good 45 minutes, even after I came there. About a week later, both a male and a female honed in on this bone set in the back meadow. And this was a plant that was still alive, but had broken halfway up and so was withering and um, was very attractive to these butterflies. And they were on the plant for a good 10 minutes after I got there and who knows how long beforehand. So at this point, I, I realized I, I, I really need to look back into this again. And I started reading more papers and I read a book on um, monarch chemical defenses, but I really found very little mention of monarchs gathering PAs. So I reached out first to some people in this country to see if they could help shed some light on this. And uh, the first one um, said it was likely a vestigial behavior, something not important now, um, probably to the monarchs, but I, it didn't really make sense to me because why would the butterflies be doing something that's meaningless to them for so long a period of time? Because it doesn't seem to me that insects have that much time and energy to waste. Uh, another person said the videos were convincing, but they had never seen it and kind of wasn't that engaged, maybe, maybe because thinking it's not that common. But I thought, well, if this is rare, why is it recurring repeatedly in one residential garden? And, and I'm not in a place where there are tons of monarchs coming through. I mean, there might be a couple of adults a day in the summertime. We have lots of caterpillars, but uh, not heavy traffic from the adults. And then uh, in that same um, spring of 2020, a new paper had come come out uh, called uh, Danaeus butterflies of the Americas do not perform leaf scratching. And it said that common species of the Americas are not attracted to vegetated PA sources, meaning that they're not going to leaves um, with PAs in them. And so I just thought, well, what am I seeing here then? And are my eyes deceiving me? So none of it was making sense. And I realized that my desk was starting to pile up high with more and more of the papers of Michael Beaupre because every time I did a search for pyrolyzidine alkaloids or butterflies and pyrolyzidine alkaloids, his papers would come up. And I was learning far more from his writings than I could find anywhere else. So I finally emailed him and I crossed my fingers that he would respond and thrill of thrills, he did. And uh, not only that, but he suggested that we work on this together and maybe do a paper about it. Uh, and also with one of his longtime colleagues, uh, Dick Van Rank. So Michael will tell you a lot more about this and the science behind it, but I just wanted to show you um, that since then I've continued to see monarchs gathering PAs. And one of my most recent sightings this past summer was of this monarch who was on this plant for uh, at least an hour. Um, and the leaves on the stems, but also on this 
on this dried flower. And if you weren't looking really closely, you'd probably think that this monarch was nectaring. Um, but he's actually at this little flower cluster that had broken and, and started withering. Another interesting observation that we made this summer was of a monarch on dried morning glory that had sprouted in a dirt pile in my driveway. And I checked with Michael and he said um, that morning glories aren't known to contain paralyzing alkaloids. Um, the, the butterfly did this for about seven minutes. And so as Michael said, the animals are the best bioindicators. So even though we don't know for sure, there's no chemical analysis yet showing that these plants contain these substances, it's something to keep in mind and, and, and maybe look for some more perhaps when conditions are right. Uh, do they have this attractant in them? And, um, and that's why we, we actually need a lot more people looking uh, for these interactions to be able to tell us what plants the monarchs might be using. And before I, I turn it over to Michael, I just wanted to mention a few of my takeaways from this experience so far are that number one, this emphasized to me, uh, once again, the importance of leaving decaying matter uh, for animals, they use it in ways that we can't even imagine sometimes. And also embracing the natives that sprout on their own in our habitats. This never would have happened if I hadn't nurtured the bone set that volunteered from our seed bank. Also believe your eyes and, and persist with your questions. And um, lastly, just remember that plants serve many different purposes. The animals interact with them in countless ways. The, the PAs that attract monarchs are actually a deterrent for deer, uh, which I find really fascinating. So, um, so with that, I will, I will turn it over to Michael and thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. We'll take the spotlight off of you. All right, Michael. Hello, everybody. Uh, do you see my slide? Yes, hello. Oh, perfect. Good. Well, dear uh, Brahmin, many thanks for the invitation to talk. I'm really very grateful for the opportunity to share some facts and ideas about monarch biology with you today. And actually, for me, this talk is very special. Here in Germany, it's just after 1 a.m. Uh, and to start to talk in the middle of the night is quite a new experience for me. I only hope it will work out well and I will not fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, for reporting your stimulating observations from your garden. Actually, for me, at first glance, Nancy's observations were all but surprising. I have often seen monarchs at plant baits, which are used, for instance, in Latin America, mainly for collecting Arctean moths. Here are some Danos plexippus in Peru and in Costa Rica, and the pictures are shot at dry plant material that I put out as baits. However, my surprise came when I looked up literature which I wanted to add to my response to Nancy's inquiry. This behavior has hardly been reported for monarchs. American entomologists apparently neglect what is called PA pharmacophagy. The peculiar behavior of monarchs, apparently gathering something from dry plant matter, is known for long but it has been very rarely reported. In 1955, William Beebe lured Danaus plexippus nicripus with wizard Heliotropium indicum in Trinidad. In 1973, John Edgar et al. saw plexippus et Heliotropium amplexicale in the New Hebrides. Also in 1973, we are in the last century, Wagner found hundreds of monarchs invading a Michigan greenhouse with flowering Epidendrum paniculatum orchids. In 1974, Andrew Atkins recorded 
Plexippus at Cotelaria in Australia. In 1975, Tom Pliske collected Plexippus at baits made of dry angiospermum, Tunifortia senecio, and Cotelaria. Well, I'm not going on, because that's all on monarchs and PAs that you can find in the literature. Very likely, many people have seen monarchs at dead plant parts, but did not consider it worthwhile to make public. However, for most relatives of the monarchs in the milkweed butterfly subtribe, the peculiar behavior has been well documented again and again since 1890 when Woodford wrote in his Naturalist Among the Headhunters, observed the butterflies, some pro black fellows flying in a crowd round a shrub with six silvery looking leaves. A branch is broken and the leaves are hanging dry and wilted. The butterflies settle on the dead leaves in swarms, almost pushing and jostling one another to get a good place. Notice, that it's a withered plant, the withered leaves and flowers that they prefer, and seem to become half stupid in their eagerness to extract the peculiar sweetness of whatever it is that the leaves contain. The video uh, is not from 1890. I did it in a greenhouse, but it's a species uh, Woodford observed. And it's nicely paralleling Nancy's videos of monarchs, I think. Woodford, Woodford was lucky to see crowds of butterflies, but unfortunately in 1890, he could not further document. But on the internet, various pages like this one are found, which depict groups of milkweed butterflies. Here we have the Romala species, a dry plant parts in Asia. All African milkweed butterflies exhibit this behavior, but most of them, in contrast to monarchs, only males are attracted. This is also true for most Latin American classroom butterflies, the sister subtribe to the milkweeds. This nice picture from the British Wikipedia article on Danaini shows three Asian species at a dry plant. But Wikipedia does not say what these butterflies are doing. Regarding monarchs at dry plant matter, a really unique picture is on the web. Tom Krauska, a butterfly lover from Missouri, I don't know if he is uh, with us tonight, in nine, 2009 recognized that flowers of Senegal tea plant, that is an invasive aquatic plant from South America, he found that these flowers are very attractive for monarchs. Consequently, he cultivated the plant in his garden pond. It grew so madly that he had to take out some plants. Next morning, he counted 27 monarch butterflies, not at flowers, but at the drying roots. And he published this photo on his website. Quite counterintuitive, isn't it? To date, it is the most impressive record of monarchs on dry plant matter available. Very unfortunately, it is kind of lost because the website just calls Gymnocoronis the best pond plant, but provides no explanation or any details. How to explain all these observations and photographs. In the 1970s, it has been recognized that the attractive uh, dry plants 
have certain pro-toxic plant secondary metabolites, namely 1,2-dehydropyrrolizidine ester alkaloids. We just call them PAs. They have them in common. <coughs> and they are taken up by the insects. By the way, after we had seen Tom Krauska's, Krauska's striking picture, we did chemical analysis of Senegal tea plant and we detected new PAs. Well, insects sequester the PAs and use them for their defense. In many Lepidoptera, but not in monarchs, the males produce male courtship pheromones from them. And this is a syndrome that has been coined as PA pharmacophagy. Insects are pharmacophagous if they search for certain secondary plant substances directly, take them up and utilize them for a specific purpose other than primary metabolism or merely host recognition. Pharmacophagy occurs in a variety of insects and with respect to various chemicals. But we look only at PAs, and the PAs do not provide nutrients. Thus, adult insects do not feed on PA plants in the literal sense, but instead they take up PAs as a kind of drug. Loosely speaking, for adult milkweed butterflies, PA plants do not represent grocery shops, but rather pharmacies. PAs are not essential for living, but they increase biological fitness. Note that the butterflies also visit dishes with pure PAs. So, strictly speaking, we are not dealing with an insect plant relationship in the common sense, but rather with an insect chemical relationship. Insects have a relationship with all the variety of different plants in their environment that provides them with the target chemicals, with the target substances. Typically, PA plants are taxonomically completely unrelated to larval food plants, and PA pharmacophagous insects do not parasitize on them. Apart from Danaini, very many tropical Arctia and moss, here are pictures from Peru and Costa Rica, and some chrysomelid beetles, and some grasshoppers, and some chloropid flies. They all gather PAs pharmacophagously. And by the way, this is a day flying Arctia and moss. You might think it's a wasp, but it isn't. PAs that insects are after represent Easter alkaloids of quite different structure. And not all structures a chemist calls PAs are relevant in the context of insect PA pharmacophagy. Oh, we do not know it yet. But don't mind, we don't go into all such chemical details. All that is important to know is that very many different structures have identical effects for PA pharmacophagous insects. So far, we know more than 900 structures. PAs are hepatotoxic, carcinogenic, genotoxic for vertebrates and humans, and they pose health risks. They are repelling and unpalatable for unadapted organisms and for insects and vertebrates, and therefore make up defensive chemicals of plants and insects against a wide spectrum of antagonists. 
livestock usually avoids feeding on PA plants because of the unpalatability due to the PAs. <coughs> but they consume them when there is no alternative feed, uh, often with fatal consequences. Humans get into contact with PAs via certain honeys, via bee pollen products, herbal teas, spices, various culinary herbs, and rarely via grain or lettuce, which is contaminated or which can be contaminated with PAs. Now the high diversity we have seen with respect to the insect taxa and with respect to the molecular structures. <coughs> the plants containing PAs are diverse too. The species are tropical or temperate. They are annuals or perennials. They are shrubs, vines, or even woody trees. Often they are rudable, rare, or dominating vegetation. PAs occur in five plant families in hundreds of species. And today, by far not all plants containing PAs are known. So there is a bias in chemical analysis towards species that are medicinically relevant for livestock and or humans. Rarely, a plant species contains just one PA. Usually, there are bouquets of several PA structures. And also, the amount varies between species and within a population, and even between different organs of an individual plant. Thus, there is great hidden inter- and intraspecific even intra-individual variation, which we unfortunately cannot see or predict specifically. That is a fact that complicates research. Why are only withering or dead or injured plants attractive? In living plants, PAs are concealed inside the cells and butterflies cannot access them with their sucking proboscides. When injured or dead, plant cells are open and PAs become accessible. PAs are not volatile, they are not odorous, and thus they are not detectable over some distance by olfactory receptors. However, when exposed in a humid environment, PA derivatives are formed and these adapted insects can smell. And when at the plant, PAs can be tasted with gustatory receptors. The attractiveness of PA plants fades over some, day, some days, likely because the molecules degrade. That is another fact that complicates research. How do Lepidoptera take up chemicals from dry plant matter? How do you drink with a straw from a dry surface? Well, the Lepidoptera regurgitated fluid, which is gut content and or saliva, and that extracts and dissolves pH. <coughs> And that is re -imbimed. the solvent is re -imbimed, enriched with PAs, with the proboscis. You clearly see the moist spot. And you can imagine that PA pharmacophagy is costly. The invested fluid, to give an example, cannot be re -imbimed completely. Of course not. Some remains in the dry plant tissue. If a plant exhibits wounds, butterflies scratch the tissue with their feet to gain access to PAs that uh, Nancy also 
observed here in this case, you see a, a real big pattern, um, uh, say kind of skeletized uh, the leaves, these African Tirumala butterflies. Please appreciate, it is essential to separate gathering of food versus PAs, in particular with respect to the sources and with respect to locating them. Food for adults is supplied by floral nectar. PAs are supplied by dead, withered or injured vegetative plant tissue. Also both nutrients and PAs are ingested via the proboscis. Different behaviors are responsible for locating sources of food and drugs respectively. They differ with respect to the cues that trigger them. Feeding behavior requires vision, even color vision, and unspecific floral odors. PA pharmacophagy doesn't involve visual stimuli, but specific volatiles. Inside the body, ingested compounds via the proboscis are also treated differently. So many different adaptations are involved in feeding behavior versus PA pharmacophagy, including sensory organs and motivation. <laughs> flowers pose a special case. Most fl P flowers of PA plants do not contain PAs in their nectar, but some do. And then they represent grocery shops plus pharmacies in one. They are kind of supermarkets. For instance, Steve Malcolm and Ben Slager reported in 2015 thousands of Danos eripus nectaring at flowers of Eupatorium arnotianum, in which they found uh, PAs subsequently. But how to know which flowers are groceries and which are supermarkets for our monarchs? Since PAs are repellent and unpalatable to non-adapted nectar foragers, PA containing nectar should be visited preferably or mainly or perhaps even exclusively by PA pharmacophagous species. Candidate plants include some but not all species of Eupatorium and of course the earlier mentioned Senegal tea plant but more might be found. More than 30 years ago, two publications reported that monarchs collected at overwintering sites in Mexico and California, respectively, that they store PAs in their bodies. Most unfortunately, no further analysis were made since then, and knowledge on sequestration of PAs in monarchs remains clearly under-investigated. On the contrary, much knowledge has been gained in the past decades on sequestration of cardinalites in monarchs. You all know that monarch caterpillars develop on milkweed plants that contain cardinalites, also called cardiac glycosides, and are avoided by most herbivores. The larvae not only are adapted to cope with these toxic secondary plant metabolites, they even store them, and this way gain chemical protection from predators. The trees are transferred from the adults, uh, not from, from the larvae to the adults, and the adults are also unpalatable. An enemy, for instance, a bird, after a poor experience with unpalatable monarchs, avoids lookalikes. Now we are with mimicry, automimicry, you know about this. 
The point I want to underline is, depending on how toxic the host plant of a caterpillar was, the resulting adult possesses more or less cardenolites, that it is, it is more or less unpalatable. In a population, we see intraspecific variation with respect to cardenolites obtained by the larva, if they had the change, a choice of different uh, milkweed species. In the adult stage, PAs are added, which makes the situation more complex. PAs cause intra individual variation over adult lifetime. Thus, monarchs vary with respect to both cardinalites and PAs. And again, the latter change over a lifetime. Note that the cardinalites and the PAs affect different types of antagonists, that is, they supplement each other. Monarchs demonstrate particularly clearly that a population does not consist of identical automata, but is rather composed of individuals with, for example, greatly varying defensive properties. And when not having only cardinalites, but also PAs in mind, the discussion of mimicry and automimicry in monarch butterflies appears to require an update. <coughs> you are also aware that monarchs can be affected by a protozoan disease that cause reduced viability of adults, Ophriocystis electroscherca, mostly called a parasite. It is much discussed that infected females select cardinalite rich host plants for egg laying and practice transgenerational medication because it was shown that cardinalites are harmful to the parasite. PAs were never considered, not even mentioned in papers relating to OA in monarchs. However, the sporozoites of OE might be harmed by PAs. Female monarchs infected with OA might be particularly eager to gather PAs. Why? Are they? From other milkweed butterflies, we know that females deposit PAs in the eggshells. The eggshells are consumed by first insta larvae, and PAs might act as medicine against the sporozoites in the caterpillar's gut. But that is just an idea. Nobody has ever considered such a thought. Monarch's PA pharmacophagy raises many questions. First of all, we need to know which plants provide monarchs with PAs. Do males and females equally go for PAs? Do monarchs visit PA plants typically or only under certain conditions? In case, which are those? For instance, infection with OE? Is pharma PA pharmacophagy an obligatory or plastic behavior in monarchs? Answers from field observations will give rise to experimental analytical studies. But there are also several obstacles. One does not know which PA plants occur where and when in the United States of America. Candidate plant species are plenty. Chemical knowledge is fragmentary. 
One cannot see the PA content of a plant. Great variability exists between different species. One cannot predict which organs are attracted. PAs often show unequal distribution within individual plants. PA pharmacophagy is not performed continuously. The butterflies become replete. Gathering PAs is not a lifelong activity, but a temporary one. And as I mentioned before, baits cannot be used for long because the attractivity fails. With my friend Dick Wainwright of the Natural History Museum in London, he is the leading milkweed butterfly expert. Last year, we have published a paper in ecological entomology. When you Google for puzzle of monarch butterflies, you can download it for free. And you can read what we report today and a little more. Well, the puzzles need to be solved, what to do? A single research group cannot investigate which plants monarchs use to obtain PAs. One needs luck to observe PA pharmacophagy in the field. As I said, it is not a permanent activity of the butterflies. So many naturalists observing with open eyes in as many places and as often as possible are sought to solve the puzzle. Maybe ask you for assistance. We have established a citizen science project called Monarch RX. It asks volunteers to look out and do PA baiting if possible and report the observations. Again, you can Google for Monarch RX with inverted commas or photograph this QR code, and then you get to the website, and there is a folder called resources, and this provides texts and background with references, as well as practical tasks and instructions. Specifically, we ask volunteers to look out for monarchs at withering or injured plants. Of course, if their proboscides are not extended, the butterfly likely are resting. But if the proboscides are extended, the butterflies likely are engaged in gathering PAs and subject for further observation. And then we can register the number of individuals, their sex, the duration of sucking. For as uh, Nancy did it, for reporting on Monarch RX, it is important which plants and which conditions are visited and what are the general conditions, location, date, time of day, weather, etc. If you don't know the plant, do some photos of living specimens, preferably with flowers, for subsequent identification. Uh, this uh, instructions and in quotes you also find on the, our website. If you are a chemist with a well-equipped laboratory and uh, a lot of staff for analyzing secondary plant metabolites via GCMS, LCMS, NMR, etc., etc., and when you are looking for a lot of work, you can contribute a lot with analysis of plants and insects. If you have, in quotes, only some time to devote to monarch research, while monarchs are around in your area, you can do baiting tests. You put up uprooted PA plants on, tra on a tray or in gorse bags and check for visiting monarchs, or better, you put drying PA plants in a butterfly trap and record number of sex of trapped monarchs. If you mark them with a felt pen, 
You can find out if individuals visit again. And there are many candidate uh, taxa, don't read them or learn them by heart. Uh, you all find that in our information material. Here is a typical butterfly trap, which easily can be made by oneself or brought as entomological equipment. So butterflies enter here at the bottom where the bait material is. They stay at the plant, uh, at the bait for some time. And when flying off, which is always towards the light, they get entangled in the netting and don't find their way out. The picture shows a trap with dry heliotropium and plant material and the Morris and Danos butterflies in Kenya, I did it about 50 years ago, it was before digital times. Keeping plant material in gauze bags facilitates recording and prevents loss of baiting material. And baiting with pure PAs is possible, but kind of theoretically, because only a very few of the very many uh, PAs are commercially available and the prices are high. 50 milligrams, 50 milligrams cost between 100 and 200 US dollars, depending on the molecule. Information on the incidence and level of infection of attracted monarchs with ophiocystis would be much wanted. It can verify the hypothesis that infected monarchs are more eager to gather PAs than non-infected ones. And to test, the test to determine the parasite is simple and can be done without killing a specimen. Please contact me if you are interested in checking the health of monarchs. <coughs> Unfortunately, a photograph with a resting monarch on dry matter without any other information, it is not helpful. However, reports such as the one which we received by Elizabeth Littler on Monarch Rx, I hope Elizabeth is with us tonight too, I have never met her, she wrote, monarch circled, landed, and stayed on withering bluebells for long periods of time. This went on for several days. When plants were removed, they followed to the compost pile. Such reports provide most valuable information. Elizabeth's unique observation clearly indicate that monarchs obtain PAs from Mertensia. Now, this can be further verified. Just published in the winter issue of the News of the Lepidopterist Society is this photograph. The legend reads, you player butterflies nectaring en masse. You see the many flowers where the many butterflies obtain their nectar from? No, no. The picture shows you players gathering PAs from seeds of heliotropium. And I'm convinced that such a picture, picture can also be taken with monarchs. If one is at the right side, at the right time. If you will be the first to take it and send it to Monarch RX, I grant you a box with Belgium chocolate. And in case you don't like chocolate, I'll ask USDA for an import permit for German sausages with sauerkraut. Here is a little tip 
for your efforts to get it. Do you know Eric Titus, Herasifulius, American burnweed, fireweed, or pilewood? It's a pioneer pterophyte, an annual herb. Your, forest, your local forester should know where to find it. Unfortunately, I myself know almost nothing about North American plants, but thanks to the internet, I learned that in your areas, this plant seems to be common. It has not been properly analyzed for PAs, but Mansky in 1939, without starting what plant parts were examined and no further details, he apparently found two PAs. Anyway, during my field work in Costa Rica, I realized that the roots are highly attractive for PA insects. Here's a sloppy video with several species of day flying Arctia and moss. According to my experience from Costa Rica, the roots and only the roots are highly attractive to PA insects. Thus, most likely American burnweed is not a usual natural source of PAs for monarchs because they typically do not stick into soil. However, for baiting and checking monarchs' appetite for PAs, it might do a good job. Perhaps it's a good tip to try it during next season when the monarchs will be back. But I cannot guarantee I'm speculating. Anyway, if American burnweed does not attract monarchs, we learn an important lesson on specificity of PA pharmacophagy in monarchs. So non-attraction can also be a very relevant observation. Uh, by the way, don't mix up erectitis with epilodium. Both are called fireweed, but epilopium has nothing to do with PAs. What can be gained and what are the consequences? With field work by citizen scientists, knowledge can be gained on resources monarchs require, and in part, at least, on the relevance of adult obtained PAs for the biological fitness uh, of monarchs. This plus additional laboratory studies will provide a more complete understanding of the biology of this iconic butterfly species, independent of what the details will show. We might find that access to PA plants is limited in certain uh, parts of the United States. And then we will find ways to support conservation efforts for monarch butterflies. I think I should not confuse you more, but rather end my talk. Let me summarize. Adult monarch butterflies need flowers, nectar, for food and larval host plants, uh, for food, and larval host plants for egg laying, but they also gather toxic chemicals, PAs from certain dead plants. Usually gathering PAs is not related to feeding behavior. Monarchs do not need PAs for living. However, sequestering PAs increases their biological fitness. There is a big gap in knowledge on relevant details of a basic behavior of monarch butterflies. Field observations and baiting tests are needed to find out which plants under which conditions are visited by which sex, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, I didn't fall asleep. I hope our presentation did not bore you, but has been stimulating your curiosity. Please look out for PA pharmacophagy 
Report your observations to Monarch Rx and contribute to better understanding the biology of our beloved monarchs butterflies. Many thanks for your kind attention. We are now looking forward to your questions and comments. And later will be available via email. And here are the references for foreign illustrations that I used in this talk. Okay, thank you thank very much. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, can we unshare, come back together for Q&A? That was a phenomenal presentation. The kudos are coming in, in on the chat box uh, like crazy. Um, and so I'm going to put um, Nancy and Michael in the spotlight. If you have a question, use the chat box or you can raise your hand with the raise your hand um, application and I will be able to um, acknowledge you. Um, there was one <coughs> question in the chat box. Let me, it was earlier on. Ah! Uh, the, well, the, the gist of it was, does the toxicity of the monarchs decrease over time when they are an adult? And that's why they have to go after the PAs. Well, that is also not very well uh, investigated. I know the respective uh, paper uh, that during adult lifetime, cardinalites can decrease. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, an individual uh, monarch, uh, to what extent that have it's only a single publication. But as I said, the PAs anyway uh, are supplementing the cardinalites, and I wouldn't say that uh, uh, because of the cardinalites uh, fading, uh, they have to get up PAs. All the other milkweed butterflies, they don't store cardinalites and the PA sequestration, uh, let's say ability, is at the very root uh, before the isomine butterflies and the, as in the milkweed butterflies have separated. So the American monarch is an outstanding milkweed butterfly but uh, to gather PAs uh, is coming from his oldest fruits, if I may say so. Was that a, a proper answer to the question? You meant the fading of cardinalites during adult life. Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, Tracy Lynn has her hand, has her hand up. Um, Tracy? Go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Thanks so much. First of all, I want to thank you for this amazing, amazing, amazing presentation. I, I raise about 500 monarchs a year. And as a side note, I'm also an herbalist and grow a ton of plants that have PAs. And you have totally, totally, totally confirmed what I've been wondering about with the monarchs in my comfrey plants because I see them in there going crazy all year long. And it is, it's after I've cut the flowers down. So the stalks are good and cut fresh and the monarchs are going crazy in there. Which plants, for instance? Comfrey, common comfrey. Yes. Yeah. So you've totally- officinalis. Totally, totally, totally confirmed what I was wondering about. Thank you so much. I but can send also a lot it of has pictures. never been reported for American monarch Danos plexippus. Not that I know of, and I'm in Canada. Um, well, in Canada, there's no literature at all on uh, monarchs and PAs. Oh, I can I can give you a ton of pictures and information because they're also in my dried up Ellen Campaign plants, but I don't know about the PAs in Ellen Campaign. I'll have to look that one up. 
Or if you give me name of the attractive plants, I, I can help you uh, with uh, knowledge on, on, on chemistry or whatever. But Great. please become a member of Monarch RX and Absolutely. put up some, some uh, reports and some pictures. And, Absolutely. You know, also the story with the Mertensia, that was a single observation. Uh, a wow. single observation is no observation. But now, since it's there, available uh, for everybody, everybody can see it. If you have Mertensia in your garden, check it out and confirm it. And if well, we have three, five, 50 or 100 such observations, we can be really sure uh -huh. that that is a plant the monarch really likes or even needs. It's at least three times a year I cut down my comfrey because I cut it after the flowers are just about done. I cut it off for medicinal benefits and I dry yeah. it. And that's when the monarchs seem to just flock to it. But I hope you don't eat too much. You know about the toxic effects I mentioned uh, PAs have for humans. <laughs> yes, no, I don't use the Comfrey officinalis. I use the Uplandica, which is totally safe. Okay. <laughs> okay. But then the monarchs you. will not come. <laughs> no, they are. <laughs> well, then it's not safe. The monarch are the bioindicators <laughs> for pyrolizidine <laughs> alkaloids. Believe me. No, I'll have to look further into that. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tracy. It looks like you have a lot of uh, pictures and input to do, to do for um, uh, for the Monarch Project. And for Lynn, I, you do not have you do not have to create your own project with the SITSI app. If there is an existing project, the um, the link was in the presentation. It's also in the chat box. I put the I I, I put the link in there, and I think that. Um, Jean's, um, uh, Jean put it in there as well. So, so scroll back through the chat box and you can click on the link for Monarch RX. <laughs> okay, and I'll take and the sausage. And on details, you can always write an email. I'll take the sausage over the chocolate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, just put, Jean just put the uh, the link in there again. Okay. Thanks Betty, so much. Betty, do you have a question? No. Okay. Does anybody else have their hand up to ask a question? Um, the hand I'm looking, I'm looking if there are any hands up. Um, let me go back to the background. It. Uh, Alan, Alan says that uh, they might have seen it on, um, our, I'm not good at these. Let me say. Um, so they're going to talk to you on email. I think that we have a lot of folks that are super excited about going out there and looking for this different behavior. So I, I, I am anticipating you're going to have a lot more observations coming to the app. Um, Bingo. Mm -hmm. so that's going to be great. And let me see. Any questions? Ella, come. I can't pronounce that. Maybe Nancy can pronounce what um, Tracy's putting in there. Um, so the question is, should we, should we, should we, should people plant these suggested plants? Can we help the monarchs um, by planting these plants that have PAs in our yard? Well, I mentioned that in one of my late uh, last slides. Um, it's too early to say that. Um, we the monarch is a peculiar butterfly. All the most of the other milkweed butterflies, only the males come. Uh, why do only the males come? Uh, because the males utilize the PAs also for courtship pheromones. But the American monarch uh, has a very outstanding courtship behavior compared to all other uh, milkweed butterflies. And uh, they are. Uh, Males are doing an aerial takedown. Um, one needs to be careful not to come into politically incorrect wording uh, in this context. Uh, Miriam Rothschild once called uh, the American monarch uh, the male chauvinistic pig in the insect world. Uh, so, uh, but 
So the monarch doesn't need, the male monarchs don't need the uh, PAs for pheromones, but they are good for defense. And the new idea which I presented today <coughs> with the parasite, uh, we don't know yet enough. I, I gave you all the literature which is uh, available to this moment. And with Monarch RX, we now have uh, in the past months now, it's winter, of course, we got 48 members, uh, but only three of, was it four, uh, reported uh, something. So there's really no background data on the relationship of monarchs uh, and PA plants. So we don't know which plants are really used in the United States. If they are rare, if there is really um, a shortage of PA plants uh, in some states, perhaps because of agriculture or whatever, uh, then we will see that the monarchs are particularly eager to coming to Bates uh, and having more background data. Then we can judge if we need to do something with respect to conservation uh, or on if it's just the behavior which has not been observed often, but which the monarchs can do and do everywhere, kind of without our uh, without us noticing it. So I would wait another season, depending on how many reports we'll get, and then we can decide on potential conservation measures. And I would just say um, that so a plant like boneset, which we do know has PAs, um, it, it comes up at least in our region all over the place if you let it. And it's actually a really great plant for lots of pollinators. So there's no harm in um, letting that grow and planting that. But there's also a question about Joe Pye that I see here. Um, and that's something that Michael was uh, actually wondering about Joe Pye weed uh, because it's a eupatorium. Um, and wondering if we could uh, hang dried baits and such. And then we got a report on Monarch RX um, from somebody who had seen it uh, a couple of years ago in the summer in Florida um, and had seen a monarch on very dead uh, Joe Pye for quite a while. And so again, that's only one report, but um, that's a, another plant then to be looking out for. And if we get more sightings mm -hmm. like that, then that helps us know that yeah. that's also a good PA plant. Um, Alan, and I, I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly, um, it's also said that it would be invaluable to compare the PA content of migrating monarchs in different stages of their migration. If it's related to cardinalide dissipation, when we're looking <laughs> at the PA, especially sought by individuals returning to Mexico, which are particularly long-lived. Well, we just this moment an email comes saying we got a new member at uh, Monarch RX website. Very nice. I hope there will be more coming after tonight. Uh, well, uh, you know, I can uh, give you another 30 minute talk on uh, what can or should be done. We are at an early stage, you know. Uh, remember, 1890s, the phenomenon of PA pharmacophagy was recognized by a traveler. In the United States, in, in, on, in, it was in Trinidad, actually. In 1955, uh, monarchs were observed, but only a few. And that was, is a side note in a publication on a different issue. And I gave you the list of the few five, or was it six, five uh, papers. And that's all we know so far. And uh, we need to go have basics. Yeah. Um, so you and we, then I, we are next on year the, I give you a 30 or 60 minute talk on following yeah. up questions. I can imagine very, very many. Uh, but step one comes before step two here in Germany. <laughs>
Yeah, so I think that it's exciting where this is this is new, unexplored territory um, that we uh, can do and be a part of real science and real exploration and real discovery um, right in our own backyard. We just have to get out there and uh, be conscious and active observers of our natural world. Um, and then make and, and jot them down, you know, make sure you're taking notes, take some photographs. And, um, and and report it in to Monarch RX. Um, right. Let's see. Uh, Mary B asks, are there PAs in the trees that monarchs overwinter on? No, definitely not. Definitely not. All right. Um, is there a list? Catherine wants to know, is there a list of native plants in which PAs have been confirmed? Well, yes, I had one on a slide uh, and that uh, we, we give the names. Uh, by now we have some more, but in our publication, which you can download for free, uh, there is a list of uh, potential uh, plants. Mm -hmm. And on the instruction, uh, slide I showed, there is also a list with uh, potential genera, uh, and that is available through Monarch RX, or you write us an email and I send you. Um, um, and this, I, this I, I need to mention- The list is all but complete. Yeah. I need to mention that the co-author of the paper, Dick Vain Wright, is attending this webinar and he's on with us. So, so Hi, Dick. shout out, <laughs> shout out to Dick. <laughs> hey, Dick. On there. Uh, this is this is great. Um, any other questions, thoughts? I know that everybody's, especially after the day we had today in Maryland, everybody's itching to get out there and and uh, and be outside more. So um, I I want to thank uh, Michael and Nancy uh, for coming and sharing this wonderful um, information with us, and especially Michael for. Uh, staying up so late and broadcasting all the way from Germany. My um, bed is not far from here. <laughs> um, we do hope if you if you make it to to Maryland, we do hope that you come and visit us uh, at the Natural History Society of Maryland. Very you're much. Than, you're, more, like. you're more than welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank and, you. And thank, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we do hope that you'll join us for additional programs online, in person, and in the field. Um, and take this knowledge, which is the most important homework of the night, is to take this knowledge and share it with other people um, so that we can keep the information flowing. Um, and I think that Michael and Nancy are, are available via email um, if you have any other questions. And please join the Monarch RX Citizen Science Project and be part of moving our scientific knowledge frontier forward. So thank you all. Um, have a wonderful evening. Stay well and stay curious. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>